Good evening, happy Easter, and let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this annual reinforcement of the truth that Jesus has been so gloriously raised from the dead. Lord, your word is so powerful, it brings life out of death. Please be at work in our hearts and minds and lives by that powerful word this evening. In the name of our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Easter Day is a day for celebration. It is also a day for reminding ourselves of what Jesus is calling us to do in the light of the events of Good Friday and Easter Day, the cross and the resurrection. Jesus sends his people out into the world to tell others about him and to bring them to him. We are looking this evening at those verses from John 20, verses 19 to 23, which tell us what happened on the evening of that first Easter day when the risen Jesus appeared to the disciples. I have two simple headings. So first, living between Good Friday and Easter day. As believers, we are given work to do by Jesus. That work is summed up here in verse 21, where Jesus says to the disciples, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's not a daunting prospect, then it should be. If it is daunting then it is some comfort to remember how those first disciples were feeling and thinking between Good Friday and Easter Day, between the death of Jesus and the day they met the risen Lord. To begin with, there's Peter and the other disciple, presumably John, who ran to the tomb of Jesus to try and work out what was going on. They saw the tomb empty. They saw the grave clothes. Perhaps they even began to understand that Jesus was alive. 20 verse 8 says the other disciples saw and believed, but they did not begin to grasp the full significance of what had happened. So verse 9 says, For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They just didn't get it. Jesus had told them often enough before his death, but it hadn't penetrated. And maybe you are like that this evening. You've heard over and over again, maybe, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Perhaps you've even been hearing that since you were knee high to a grasshopper. But you just don't get that the resurrection isn't just a clause in the creed that we've just been reciting, but it's the pivotal point of the whole of history, the whole of God's plan for the world. Like Peter and John at that stage, you don't understand. Or maybe we're more like Mary Magdalene. Before Jesus appeared to her, she was in despair. Three times her weeping is mentioned in those three verses, 11 to 13. Mary said to the angels, they have taken away my Lord. He was wrong, of course, but that's how things looked to her. Christ had gone. She was left alone, abandoned, and grief-stricken. That kind of hopeless sense that Christ has gone from our lives, that we're useless without him, can still inflict us. And when it does, it drains us of energy for the Lord's work. We're left spiritually limp and lifeless. We lose heart and are tempted to give up. I remember a period in my own life when my witness was crippled by just such feelings. Anyone who's tried to help someone entrapped in the tentacles of spiritual depression and hopelessness will know how desperately difficult it can be to get through. 
And in the end, it's not something that we can do. It needs a work of the Holy Spirit to bring us out of that. But thank God the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, now as then. And then in verse 19, the scene changes to that room where the disciples were meeting on the evening of that, first, of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They had no confidence, they had no boldness, they were afraid, they felt their enemies had the upper hand and the best they could do was nothing at all, lock themselves away in case they got noticed. Now, Satan is indeed prowling around like a roaring lion, and we need a proper awareness of danger. But too many of us, too much of the time, are like those disciples with the doors locked and bolted against a hostile world. We never venture out from the cozy security of our own patch because fear has got the better of us. Or maybe we just don't believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead, as Thomas didn't. At first, Thomas, of course, missed out on seeing and hearing Jesus on this occasion that we're looking at. He was off elsewhere, but he was told all about it, and he wouldn't believe. Verse 25, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. The question for us is whether we are stuck, as it were, between Good Friday and Easter Day. At the start of that evening, those disciples were not in any fit state to be sent out to to turn the world upside down. They were living between Good Friday and Easter Day. They needed radical spiritual surgery And that's what they get. And that brings me to my next heading. So secondly, living after Easter Day. Look again at uh, from verse 19 to verse 20. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Suddenly, Jesus is with them again. Jesus came and stood among them. How wonderful that is. Jesus is standing among them. When Jesus is with you, fear fades. Despair turns to hope. This evening, he is with us, among us. We don't have his physical presence like those disciples did that evening, but we do have his real presence by his Holy Spirit. That is the promise also in the Great Commission, of course, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verse 20. Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We can depend on that. Whenever we are tempted to despair, we need to turn to this promise. Jesus is with us. Knowing that does put an end to despair. And in the same way, Mary's misery vanished when she recognized Jesus' voice speaking her name. Through the Spirit, Jesus opens our spiritual eyes to see again that he is alive and he will never leave us. The disciples had been told that Jesus would rise from the dead and they didn't grasp it. We have been told that Jesus has risen from the dead and at times we don't grasp it either, but it's true. Jesus is alive. He is with us by his Spirit. He speaks your name. We can know as those disciples knew, that Jesus is alive. And then with the presence of Christ comes the peace of Christ. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, 
peace be with you. What did he mean by that? On one level, that was simply the conventional Jewish greeting, but in this context, it meant so much more. Before his death, Jesus had promised his peace. John 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. But this is not a negative piece. It's not the absence of bad news from our lives. It's not the absence of hassles at work or tantrums from the children. This piece is not the absence of trouble from our lives. It is the peace that flows from the cross. Peace with God. Peace with one another through the sacrificial, sin-bearing, substitutionary death of Jesus. There can be no peace without the cross. That is why as soon as Jesus had said this first word of peace, he showed them his hands and his side. He surely didn't do that just as proof of identity, like some kind of passport. He did it to point them to the cross as the fountain of peace. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 13 and 14, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The wall is down between God and you and between you and me because of those wounds of Jesus. He is with us. And he brings us the peace that flows from the cross. And when we've experienced these things, then our lives can no longer be bleak and faithless like Thomas at that early point. Instead, we can have a deep joy like that of the, of the disciples. Verse 20, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. It's a delightful understatement. The disciples were glad. They overflowed with joy when they saw the Lord. The light of Christ dispels the darkness. And now Jesus' words turn the minds of the disciples to the work that he has planned for them. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And it seems to me that isn't just repetition for the sake of it. If the first time he was speaking peace to the disciples' troubled hearts, then this time... It's as if Jesus is saying to us, this peace is not just for sitting on, it's not just for you, it's for sharing. It's for the world. It's always the way that when Jesus sets us free from despair, he sends us out to serve him. I remember very clearly in my own experience, a time when I was freed from an oppressive and debilitating burden of spiritual depression, the like of which I have never known since. And the first result was the deep joy of knowing that Jesus was indeed alive and with me. And the second result was that I was thrown into active Christian service as I had never been before. As a church, we help to support a range of people who are pouring out their lives, doing really difficult, long-term gospel work around the world. Why do they do that? Because they know the peace of Christ in their own hearts, and they long that others would come to share in it. And that longing chimes in with the work that we've been given to do by our risen Lord. So in verse 21, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In other words, my work is now your work. Go and get on with it in my name and with my authority behind you. God is ascending God. He sends us out together, not alone, together, to continue the mission of Jesus. 
Jesus lived as a, servant, as a servant in obedience to his heavenly Father, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And now that's our task, and we are sent out to tell the world that Jesus, the King of the kingdom, has come and to call people to turn back to him before it's too late.